Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring our neuropsychologist Dr. Laura Jansen, Dr. Skip Wren, tech whiz Santiago Brand, and neurofeedback legend Jay Gunkelman. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. This is an all-star cast that are more than happy to share their knowledge with you. My name is Pete, and before we start, we'd like to thank our business supporters, Outrageous Baking. They're a dedicated gluten-free bakery that has been around for 15 years. Tor Talk wants more people to discover text-to-speech, alternative behavioral therapy, neurofeedback service in Vancouver, Washington. We'd like to welcome our newest Patreon business supporter, Amazing Brains in Vail Valley and Summit County, Colorado. Ask for Micah. How you doing, Micah? Welcome aboard, buddy. We'd also thank EEG and me, Sadia M, Jonathan Rowan, January Terrell, and Loretta T. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Really helps get the word out. If they can't hear us, we can't help them. Okay, guys, got a couple listener questions before we get to uh, the main topics. We're going to be talking about neuroinflammation, holistic approaches, to neurofeedback, and heart rate variability. Okay, listener question. Micah asks, I would love to hear what the guys think about TDCS and TACS. Also dive into SMR, one of my favorite protocols to run. Very versatile. I know it's been talked about in the past as well. Micah, thanks for being a listener and also a supporter. Guys, what is TDCS and TACS? I think that Laura's muted, but uh, I think she gave the answer. You, you can go ahead. You're, you're unmuted. <laughs> I'm talking to stimu- brain stimulation, but I'll let you uh, elaborate. Transcranial direct current stimulation is literally passing a current in a single polarity uh, through the through the brain, and it excites or inhibits the basal membrane, uh, which allows the cortex to be either more or less active. If you put the plus electrode on top of a cortical area, you increase the electronegativity of the basal membrane, and that activates the brain. If with the minus there, you deactivate that brain area. Um, Quite often, you can only put one of the polarities on the head. The other one has to go on the shoulder, but both of the electrodes have to be on the human. Otherwise, it doesn't make a circuit. It won't pass any current at all. Um, it, It has... It's an old, old, old approach. Uh, Pliny the Elder uh, used torpedo fish, an electric eel, to therapeutically treat migraine and epilepsy. And if uh, uh, Claudius Galen uh, quotes Pliny the Elder having done it, you know it's old. Um, This goes back to uh, Mount Vesuvius blowing up in that era. So this isn't a new technique. We're a much fancier now. We don't put a lungfish on your head and have the electric eel zap you. Uh, we use slimy electrodes instead of a slimy eel. But uh, it, it's not a lot more accurate than it used to be. Uh, you're passing a gross current through the cortex. It, it's hard to direct the current. It doesn't always just happen underneath where you have the electrode. Uh, if you intend to treat the anterior cingulate, which is deep, you can't just put an electrode on the surface and expect the current to find its way down. You end up having to have a higher density array to kind of guide those currents. But simple DC stim is a very powerful approach uh, if you use it uh, accurately uh, and, and don't overdo it, um, it. It has very good results. It's very easy to overdo it. People turn up the current density to the point that the person can feel it. And about the time you can feel it strongly, it's a skin effect, not just a brain effect. And, you know, making the skin red in an area isn't therapeutic to the brain. Uh, That's, it's, you know, you can actually, if you pass too much current, you can blister the skin. That's a mistake. Um, But uh, 0.5 milliamps uh, of current is uh, enough to make an effect. Most people can't feel that at one milliamp most people can just barely start to feel it. Uh, if you're electrically sensitive, you can feel it at 0.5. Um, but it, it, as soon as you can feel it at all, uh, don't go far farther up than that. If you feel vaguely like it's on and there's a little tickly tingle, that's more than enough current. You, you don't need to turn it up. 
um, TACS is alternating current and it doesn't have as predictable an outcome uh, as DC stim. Uh, it has to do with the frequencies that are going on in the, in the brain, uh, whether the frequency you're stimulating at has some resonant frequency within the brain as to whether it has a, a, the effect that you expect. So it's, it, it sort of depends upon what the brain is doing as to what, whether DC stim, excuse me, AC stim uh, it ends up having a, a, a positive effect in the way that you think it's going to. There is some evidence that stimulating at the alpha frequency increases alpha, kind of like pulsing light at alpha frequencies increases alpha. You're, you're stimulating the brain with a frequency and it responds, especially if it has a resonant frequency at that frequency to respond to. Um, <clears throat> TDCS is dirt cheap. Uh, yeah. I, I described the, the circuitry to somebody in the military and, and they went to Radio Shack and built one and uh, they, they actually put a case on it and uh, made it a little bit more expensive than just a raw board, uh, but they, they ended up under 30 bucks, you know. Um, so, you know, if you can whip one together that works perfectly well under 30 bucks yourself, uh, don't expect a manufacturer to make a fortune off of it. Uh, if you're paying more than about $500 for a DC stim device, you're overpaying. Um, uh, they're, they're very inexpensive to make. I just would like to, to say that I have used TDCS, not TACS. And I have found it to be extremely helpful uh, when it is properly done, as Jay was saying, and when combined with neurofeedback. I think that utilizing this system or any other form of, of evidence-based stimulation along with neurofeedback, uh, it's, it helps you get more profound results. I have found that when I do combine neurofeedback with other modalities, clients get uh, faster and more profound, more sustainable benefits over time. And as Jay says, it's really affordable. And if, if done right, if done by the right person, by the right professional with the right credentials can be very, very helpful. And I've used it for migraines. I've used it on people with OCD. I've used it on people with depression. You know, across the board, several conditions. And it, it does really work very well. I, I think that whatever you can do to help stabilize the brain, in addition to neurofeedback, is, is, uh, is the way to go. I haven't used TACS, but TDCS I've used for many years now. And I, and I find it again extremely useful. And I think that, you know, professionals should, should look into these options as well. Now, I know there's people who only use neurofeedback and have really good results, but I think they could have um, better results or, or fast results if they were to combine with these types of options as well. In addition to DC stem and AC stem, uh, there's TMS, which uses a very expensive magnet. You know, you can range from about 80,000 to about 250,000. So it's not a $200 device or a $500 device. This is a small fortune device. Um, it, it's in the US, you have to be a psychiatrist to uh, prescribe the, the, the TMS. Um, uh, in Europe, you can be a psychologist as well. Uh, and, and, you know, it'll just take a little bit of time before the uh, the U.S. catches up to the international standard of allowing people that work with psychiatry and psychology to both use something that alters brain function. Um, but the, uh, TMS uses a very powerful magnet between three, uh, uh, between 1.5 and 3 Tesla. Uh, so it's about the same strength as the MRI machine that you get in, uh, a new MRI machine. And uh, uh, it can literally evoke potentials. If you put the coil at the spot that it has the hand represented, you can make the fingers twitch. If you put it on the top of the head where the feet are, you can make the toes twitch. So it literally evokes a potential. Uh, it, uh, it, it's a very powerful uh, intervention. It's approved for depression um, and it's approved for OCD. Uh, internationally, uh, OCD is covered in other countries, but in the U.S., no insurance company to date pays for OCD treatments for TMS, even though it's approved by the FDA. So 
uh, go figure, an insurance company and want, not wanting to pay for something. Who would have thought, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. Um, that is something I don't use in my practice. Um, I do the neurofeedback. We do cap uh, work. We do uh, single channel, uh, a lot of Z-score stuff, um, a, a variety of you know ways we use neurofeedback. If somewhere, someone wanted to get into the uh, stimulation, what would be a first step for them? Well, first step is going to end up being taking a course from somebody who teaches you how to do it properly. Uh, 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 I, I wouldn't just rely on a manufacturer's uh, quick and dirty, uh, turn it on, stick the electrodes on the head and, and, and you're up and running. Uh, you should end up having a course that allows you to learn the underlying uh, physiological mechanisms and, um, uh, and there's a way to target it using the EEG. The beta spindles are hyperexcitable cortex. If you put the minus electrode on top of a beta spindle and put the plus on the shoulder, you can drive the beta spindle down with the, with the minus electrode. Um, and uh, that, that can end up helping with CZ beta spindles and insomnia, for instance, or frontal beta spindles uh, with the, the, as one of the subset of attentional and affective disorders. Um, uh, SMR is a whole different thing than STEM. And it's, it's uh, you know, kind of hit reset and uh, a whole, whole new topic here. Uh, SMR is a sleep spindle. It was a sleep spindle when you're very young, six months to nine months old, a year old, your sensory motor rhythm is already set. You're actually very good at sleeping at one year old. Uh, so the sleep mechanisms are there. It's not like alpha that has to mature up to speed. It's, it's already set very early in life. And the sleep spindle is the same thing as SMR. It's a stabilizing rhythm at night after you, you experience a stimulus. If you have a good sleep spindle, you continue to descend into sleep. If you don't have a good sleep spindle, every little thing wakes you back up so you don't have good sleep onset and you have excessive wakefulness. So insomnia, which is a poorly done sleep spindle, can be assisted with SMR training. You're training up the same nuclear body, the same generator. It's just during the day uh, with a different name. Uh, we, we change the name in EEG just to keep people fooled, you know. Um, but the, the sensory motor rhythm was identified initially by Barry Sturman. Um, and uh, he, he started with uh, animal studies with cats um, and uh, he trained the cats with a, an indwelling electrode, how to produce the SMR for reward. Uh, and he should have actually sacrificed those cats when he was done with that experiment, uh, but he already had them all hooked up with indwelling electrodes and they were gonna need them for another experiment. So instead of sacrificing it, getting a whole bat, brand new batch of cats, uh, he, he kept some of them in the next study. And the next study was rocket fuel from NASA, monomethylhydrazine. And it would cause convulsions in janitors that had to clean it up. Uh, so they, they wanted to figure out uh, what the dose response curve was. And those damn cats that he taught SMR ruined his dose response curve because they didn't have seizures like the other cats did. Well, Barry had a friend who had epilepsy and he's basically, if, if you can train cats not to have a seizure, how about me? You know, So they trained a human how to make the same kind of a rhythm they found it positively impacted his rate of seizure and the whole field of SMR for epilepsy was started uh, you know, a long, long time ago. When I started in 1972, Barry had already published uh, major publications about SMR and uh, uh, really powerful uh, outcome studies in epilepsy. You'd think, well, why isn't SMR being used for epilepsy worldwide? Well, it is, but only by a few practitioners here and there. It's not, you know, generally done by the epileptologists and neurologists. Um, it's done by the neurofeedback world, and it's not the same world. Uh, so, it, it's not generally accepted uh, as a routine treatment for uh, epilepsy. But some people with epilepsy end up finding out about it and finding a practitioner. Uh, it's very, very effective. 
were in the midst of a case report publication uh, of a series of six people that were intractable epileptics that are now seizure-free and medication-free. So it works really, really, really well. Uh, Barry's original work with cats extrapolated the people really extremely well, uh, and it was validated uh, on epilepsy, but it also works on other things. It's a stabilizing rhythm. What else could need stabilizing? Oh, hyperactive kids, for instance. So SMR was used for hyperactivity in the 1970s by Lubar, and uh, they found good results with it. Um, Lubar, in a throwaway comment in one of his papers said, oh, by the way, they, they said they slept better. And wouldn't you know, many years later, there's uh, efficacy quality research to support the use of SMR type training uh, for insomnia. Uh, it works very, very well. It's a sleep spindle. You know, why wouldn't it work well with insomnia? It, it, it's, it's how your brain stabilizes itself at night. So um, it, it started out with rocket fuel and uh, uh, cats. Uh, it, it evolved to humans and epilepsy and then hyperactivity and then other applications, including insomnia. SMR is set in your early life. It's usually between 12 and 14 hertz somewhere. The 12 to 15 range is what most software focuses on for SMR training. But, you know, it was set when you were a year old. It doesn't come out like some textbook. Everybody's a little different in your tuning. Sturman's original observations in humans in their database that they collected was that SMR ranged from 11 to 19, the group average at 13. 12 to 15 catches most, but not all. Uh, they worked with a, an autistic kid and found his SMR because they let him go to sleep. They could count the sleep spindles. They found his SMR was at 10. So don't expect 12 to 15 to work for everybody, but most everybody. If you don't get the expected response, get them to sleep. Look at their EEG, count the sleep spindles. You know, Right after a vertex sharp wave, there's a bunch of spindles. Count the frequency, you'll know exactly what their SMR is tuned to. There's no question about that. So um, SMR is not the same thing as mu. There's a whole bunch of confusion about that. There shouldn't be. Mu is related to alpha. It matures up to speed across the years. Uh, by the time you're seven, eight, nine years old, it's up to speed typically. Uh, but your SMR is already tuned faster than your alpha earlier in your life. That's, they're not the same thing. They're not interchangeable words. Uh, if anything, if you, if you look at SMR, and you're looking for an EG classical term uh, to communicate with people that don't do neurofeedback and have never heard of SMR, you can call SMR sigma. Sigma is the term for a sleep spindle. And the classical EG people will understand sigma. Oh, it's a sleep spindle. You know, so uh, that uh, they'll, they'll understand what you're talking about at that point. Yeah, no, with regards to SMR, I, uh, <clears throat> it's, very interesting how exquisitely it works um, on the brain. And it, it, whenever I do SMR training, um, particularly in regards to children, um, sometimes the chief complaint is uh, attention, mostly ADD, ADHD, or some type of oppositional defiant behavior. But interestingly, the very first thing that 90 to 99% of the parents report as gain is sleep. Even before attention, even before behavioral changes, is sleep. They say he's sleeping better. He's not waking up throughout the night. He's not moving throughout the night. He's waking up and he's ready to go. He's not slowing, getting up to speed and showering and, and eating breakfast slowly. So the very first thing that changes is sleep. And of course, if you optimize sleep, you're going to optimize growth. Uh, growth hormone is secreted throughout sleep. And a lot of this kids grow in height as well. And that's very interesting as well. And um, skin complexion changes. So parents notice that skin complexion gets much better. Uh, there's an improvement in sleep. And then also uh, the, the, the growth factor. And I, I, I agree with Jay in that looking at the EEG is quite important uh, because sometimes the chief complaint is ADD or ADHD and they come diagnosed via teachers at school or another professional. But when you look at the eyes closed EEG, uh, a lot of these kids, a lot of these people have severe sleep disturbances or even sleep disorders. 
I just did an EG last Monday here, and that was the case. The mom is a counselor friend of mine, and she's saying he's got a lot of impulse control issues. He's not paying attention in class. He's struggling at school. Obviously, ADD is the word that comes to mind. But, you know, upon looking at his eyes closed, and I always record eyes closed first, within the first minute, this kid was out. I mean, and you see the vertex wave at about 60 seconds. And throughout the, the whole recording was stage two with the vertex wave followed by the spindles. And I said to the mom, well, it may be attention, but we have a possible sleep disorder here. And you have to go get a, a polysomnogram. She's like, but he doesn't wake up throughout the night. So I turned to the kid and say, are you waking up tired every morning? Are you waking up feeling sluggish? And he says, every single day. Are you struggling to stay, stay awake, awake at school in class? Every single day. So normally there's the misconception that if you don't wake up throughout the night, uh, sporadically, or you wake up at a point and you can go back to sleep, you have poor sleep. And that's not necessarily the case. Therefore, I think that the EEG is probably the best educational tool you can have because parents have no idea or parents can be in denial. But when you present the info, the client uh, you know, will tell you the truth. And kids, you know, for the most part, are quite honest. Um, and, and so you know, looking at this and, and, and training stabilizing frequencies, it's very, very important. But it all starts with the EEG. I think it, or for at least for the most part, starts with the EEG. I mean, if you don't have an EEG, you have very little to go with. I quite so, often see very brief EEGs being recorded nowadays, people trying to get it done quicker uh, with less impact. But if you don't record a 10 minute eyes closed, you don't have the amount of data that the vigilance modeling people use to model uh, your ability to stay awake and vigilant and focused. And uh, the precipitous descent into stage two sleep before 300 seconds is what a sleep lab uses as a standard. Uh, they have a, what's called an MSLT, multiple sleep latency test. It's an afternoon nap. If you complain of insomnia and you go into a sleep lab, they basically won't test you. They can't get reimbursed for it. Uh, if you go in for your afternoon nap and you complain, I can't sleep, it's in a lab, you're not the kind of customer they normally see. They normally see people with a sleep disorder that fall asleep at the drop of a hat. If you tell them to go lay down and take a nap, they just ask where they won't complain about the accommodations. So um, uh, if you fall asleep again with a vertex sharp wave before 300 seconds on the average for th five naps during the afternoon, uh, you qualify for a sleep study. In fact, you, they have to do your sleep study. They can't deny you the coverage at that point. You've passed their screening. The screening is there to deny coverage. It's not there to help people with sleep problems. It's, it's there to deny coverage for some people. If you fall asleep to stage two uh, at uh, uh, 330 seconds, you didn't qualify. Well, that's silly. I mean, you're, you're still falling asleep way, way, way too early and you still have a problem, uh, but the insurance companies have set that standard as a, a cutoff point uh, beyond which they won't pay for the study. Uh, I had a three bed sleep lab for a number of years in Los Angeles, and uh, there's no economics to doing sleep studies. They've squeezed all the profit out of it as, as a good insurance company will, you know, um, uh, how can they pay their executives and stockholders if they don't deny coverage? So, uh, you know, we, uh, a sleep lab is basically uh, where you would send somebody for a full diagnosis. If the kid fell asleep to stage two with vertex sharp waves a minute into the EG, they should go to a sleep lab. They, they would have qualified based on the falling asleep pattern of 300 seconds if you fall asleep at 60 seconds. So uh, the uh, full qualification at that point. Um, and uh, if you don't go to a sleep lab, uh, uh, you may end up missing the fact that the person goes hypoxic. You know, why don't they sleep well? Well, they could be going hypoxic, central apnea. Your brain doesn't tell your body to breathe and you wake up with a big gulp of air just before you're hypoxic enough to be a problem. You drop, drop below 90% oxygen, which if you're a COVID patient, they'd put you on oxygen, uh, but you're asleep and nobody's monitoring your oxygen necessarily. Uh, if you go hypoxic at night, you have to have a breathing machine or, or a surgery to open up the airway if it's obstructive. 
but you can't just ignore that. Uh, my last business partner uh, uh, had the sleep lab. Uh, when we split up the company, he kept the sleep lab. He ended up passing in his sleep from not wearing his CPAP machine. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're not exactly uh, easy to use all the time. They're uncomfortable sometimes, and he just didn't use it that night. He slipped below the uh, hypoxic level and just didn't come back. So don't make the mistake of ignoring a precipitous descent into stage two sleep as just being a sleep issue. It can be a fatal thing to mistake as not to catch it. Uh, uh, there are other kinds of sleep disorders other than apneas. There's restless leg, circadian rhythm. There's behavioral sleep disorders. Some people wake up feeling paralyzed. Um, some people have night terrors, sleepwalking, sleep talking. There's all sorts of sleep problems. A sleep lab is a good place to have a good referral network already set up because if you're doing neurofeedback on an ongoing basis, you're going to refer people to a sleep lab because of this precipitous descent into stage two sleep. There, there's often physiological reasons for these behaviors you're seeing. And again, back to the lay folks where things can get sometimes when a kid's acting out, misbehaving, doing whatever it is, fill in the blank, is that it's some kind of willful production or, or you know, it's got some diagnoses that go with it too, oppositional defiant, good words like that. And there, there's other reasons. And, and I know it's not always easy to accept that. Um, but to pursue these other maybe drivers for these behaviors, if you have a crappy night's sleep, you don't have a great day. Like it's all, it's as simple as that. And then just, you know, apply the exponent. Sleep's pretty damn important. Okay, hey guys, we had one more listener question and it's not so much we're going to answer it as we're going to kind of set the expectations for the people that email questions in. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not here to diagnose everybody. We're not WebMD. We're not, you know, Dr. Google here. But uh, I'm going to read the question, and then we can kind of address the information that we would be looking for if we were going to not diagnose or make a recommendation for, for training. Uh, hi, Pete. I've just discovered the YouTube videos, and they are fabulous. That's why I want to read the letter. The promise of the internet is fine. <laughs> that's, the, that's it, right? That's the whole point. <laughs> well, next question. Yeah, next we'll, letter. <laughs> we'll edit that out in post. The promise of the internet is finally getting uh, met in casts like this. Thank you. I have a question. My daughter is adopted and has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Is there any research or newer, newer protocol development in neurofeedback for this malady? Or is treatment more dependent on specific issues seen in the EEG? Uh, fetal alcohol uh, syndrome is uh, an extreme case. There's also fetal alcohol effect, which is still problematic. Uh, but full fetal alcohol syndrome is actually uh, alcohol exposure in utero. Um, and it, it changes the, the front plate on the, the head. You get teeth that are gapped too far apart you get a flattening of the frontal plate. So the, the, the contour of the face is a little bit flattened. If you look for a side profile, it doesn't have the, the extent of the features. So, uh, and there's severe uh, intellectual disability, unfortunately. Fetal alcohol effect, you have a lot of the behavioral problems, but you don't have the obvious physical presentation, the, the gap in the teeth and the flattening of the front, uh, frontal plate. So. Uh, they're a little harder to get diagnosed, uh, but it's it's also e equally uh, debilitating. Uh, both uh, syndrome and effect are uh, severe circumstances. Um, generally, they have a slightly slower background rhythm in the EEG. It doesn't have to be outside the normal range, but it's at the slow end of the normal range, and it's, it's not optimized for cognitive function. Um, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome can end up being educable, but they're generally not going to be, you know, really sharp. Um, it, it, it's an unfortunate uh, uh, exposure in utero uh, that shouldn't have happened. Uh, people nowadays realize that alcohol is not the thing to do when you're, when you're pregnant. If I look back to the advertisements that were uh, present in the newspaper and on television when I was a kid, they had women smoking, uh, 
and drinking and it was it, uh, there wasn't any concern over this sort of thing but nowadays if you see a woman who's pregnant who smokes or drinks something usually there's social pressures for her to stop that sort of thing specific to the individual uh, you can generally suggest that there's going to be a retuning uh, uh, to, to try to speed up the background rhythmicity but uh, you, you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis there's no um, protocol for fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol effect that that you know all of them look the same so you do the same treatment it's just not the same that it's just not the case i'm going to tangent a little bit i mean certainly you know there's great information about fetal alcohol syndrome absolutely uh, i know skip and i see a lot of those uh, kind of uh, clients in, in our practice with a, a lot of different executive functioning issues so absolutely a, a good population we should be discussing um, I'm also, the tangent I want to go on has to do with, um, I think the bigger uh, uh, comment that Pete had was, okay, we're getting um, some great uh, responses from our podcast. I think we're getting some great questions. We have a, a, a great variety of people who listen to us. You know, we have the clinicians who, um, you know, can debate with Jay and Santiago. Uh, there, there's other clinicians who are therapists and then there are clinicians who are techs and you know don't necessarily know all, all the um, necessary you know geography and landmarks of the brain, but they know enough to provide trainings at the leadership of other people. So we we have uh, in the parents, you know, we have people, and then people who are curious about what neurofeedback is and you know what is what is this sorcery and and you know what are you guys doing there? Um, so a uh, vast uh, audience that we have. Um, the, the first thing, I, I threw a flag on the field. I was, I was the first person to throw my hand up on the Zoom call here to um, kind of bring up this issue. Like, you know, we're, you know, certainly professionals. We have, uh, you know, uh, diverse backgrounds also. We come from different clinical places and different trainings, et cetera. Um, the, the flag I wanted to throw on the field had to do with actually HIPAA. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a patient who referenced Jay. And um, this might be something that we have to cut out of the podcast. Maybe we should talk about this later. We should talk about it now. Um, but I, I'm, I'm assuming, and, and this kind of sounds a little silly to, to bring up or, or ask questions about, but I'm assuming that neurofeedback pra practitioners have to um, uh, value HIPAA or, or uh, respond um, you know, to these kind of questions. And you know, I, I can't confirm or, or, or deny that I know X, Y, Z about anybody specifically, um, although if she's, you know, writing in or calling in, then, um, you know, she's kind of giving herself up, so to speak. So, so that, that's one part of this. And the other thing, you know, Pete was uh, alluding to it that, you know, it's hard to um, specifically answer questions, you know, we're all different levels of licensure and, you know, certainly we have to uh, respect the HIPAA and the privacy uh, for sure. Uh, we have to practice un under these um, expectations and, and it's for the good of the patients. We, we don't want to have unhealthy relationships with, with the patients and, and have different um, uh, power differentials and, and, and this kind of thing, you know, working with patients. So it, it's hard to answer questions that are very specific about someone's specific uh, clinical condition. And so as Pete was saying, you know, um, you know how, do, how do we want to define you know, what we're doing here and, and what, what questions are fair, what, que what questions aren't fair. I guess they're all fair because you, you can ask them, you know, we have a, a choice whether we're going to answer them or not. So, you know, if people are asking specific questions, I, I think that's, that's a good time, um, you know, to think about, you know, are, are you calling or writing to ask, you know, medical advice? Um, and, and sometimes we get that because there, there's not many of us out there and, you know, how many are you know at the level that these guys are not many so you know it's a uh, great questions to ask but you know at the same time we have to be careful about um you know how we answer these questions and how specific we can be because we you know if we don't know every single you know we, we haven't done an evaluation then we actually can't say anything um you know many many people want to diagnose people in public many people want to um you know, different politicians or different people in the media. And it's, you know, compelling. Um, you know, we want to get drawn into that. But, you know, the, the bottom line is we really don't know. We can't answer, you know, these kind of cl clinical questions. 
um, from afar without doing a, uh, a full evaluation. And, th and that's good because, you know, if people are, are coming in to see us, you know, who aren't listening to the show or who do, do listen to the show and do come in to see us, uh, people need to know that we're, you know, doing our due diligence and we're, we're getting to know people and getting to know background, um, you know, from all, all different angles, not just, you know, cognitive functioning, but we're asking about family systems and we're asking about other psychological issues and other medical concerns. I, I guess that's a lot to say to, you know, respond to one question, but the point is um, that, you know, we, we're happy to answer vague, you know, uh, general questions, technical questions, theoretical questions, but when it comes to specific answers, um, we're going to have to punt because, um, you know, it's, it's not fair and, um, you know, we don't know for, you know, doing the right thing by individuals, you know, not having the full evaluation. This, this is not not anywhere near as uh, uh, deep into the HIPAA weeds as the uh, listservs are, uh, where people post questions about themselves and their kids and stuff. I, I cringe at some of the listservs. I've dropped off of some of them that are uh, too open to the general public because there's no professional boundaries being exercised in the listserv. So uh, you, you can't really hang out to that kind of a neighborhood. Um, it, it, it's dangerous, you know. Um, uh, but uh, uh, even uh, the, the well-managed listservs uh, quite often have a little boundary issue happening. So um, here, at least, we've got Pete standing firmly between us and any HIPAA problem, uh, 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 whole, towing the line, making sure that we don't end up having a parent's name and the kid's name and the EG finding and everything all posted all at once. So I, I think we're towing the line well enough, but the people asking questions need to realize that we are going to tow that line and not, you know, not venture a wild DSM guess as <laughs> like we're DSM folks in the first place, you know? Um, so uh, uh, don't expect a diagnosis from people that don't do diagnostics uh, in, in that way. Anyway, I'm, I'm happy to see people asking deep questions. It, it means people are thinking. Um, goodness knows there's precious little of that nowadays. So um, it's good to see. Uh, Santiago, our friend in uh, Singapore, would you like to address a neuroinflammation? I, I started in the field of neurofeedback in 2008. So it's, I've been doing this for a good 14 years now. And obviously along the years, you come across different people who change the way you view things. I mean, Jay, of course, being one of the main ones. But then I think also out of your own health experiences, you, you learn how to reinvent yourself professionally. And I remember a few years ago, I came across this, uh, this book called Why My Brain Isn't Working. Uh, as I was reading the book, I realized how much I didn't know about other aspects uh, of brain health. And this book pertains, you know, it, it, it writes about brain health more from a medical perspective. And I then decided to, you know, get informed on this and, and obviously change and optimize the way I, I see my clients. And it's, the book is written by a functional medicine practitioner, functional medicine doctor. And I, I wasn't feeling well at, at, at the time, I remember. Uh, I was feeling dizzy throughout the day, very tired, bloated after I ate certain foods. My performance wasn't, wasn't the best. And I went um, and looked for a functional medicine professional in Colombia when I was living at the time. And I found somebody, I went to see them, I explained my symptoms, they ordered all this thorough testing and uh, found out that I was pre-diabetic and had all these issues. And, uh, you know, I learned about myself and I learned that, uh, that I needed to change, uh, get my act together uh, because otherwise how I was going to treat people and get them to, to become better if I wasn't doing it myself. And one of the first things I learned about approaching uh, mental health or neurofeedback or brain optimization, brain health with people is that you have to look at lifestyle. Uh, in my experience, and I want to I want to say that anything I, I mentioned from here on is not intended as medical advice. So don't take this medical advice. Go see a professional. But uh, I noticed that 
When people come with a chief complaint or set of complaints, the first thing that is causing their pain, their discomfort, uh, and, and why they come to secret services is lifestyle. More often than not is lifestyle. And lifestyle as it pertains to two or three specific items, one being nutrition, the other one being exercise, and the other one being sleep. And to me, those three are really, really big. And if somebody wants to work with me in, in my clinic, they have to exercise, they have to change their lifestyle, their dietary habits, and they have to do whatever they can to get better sleep. Okay. Because I see them as very, very important. I, I have been witness to the power of neurofeedback all these years. And I had the privilege of helping many people. But I have come to learn as well that unless people make drastic changes or at least some changes in lifestyle as it pertains to those three categories, there's really nothing we can do. You know, I, I, I started when I was younger and I was really idealistic and I thought I could save the world. And then <laughs> you learn people are people. And, uh, and then there's, there, there's sometimes there's nothing you can do for people unless they have the motivation to do that. And, I'm very clear in, in when I talk to people about uh, their expectations of my work. And I say, if you're not motivated, you better not do it. If you don't have the willpower, you better not do it because you're going to be wasting your money and your time and you're going to get only more frustrated. And uh, as I was learning about this, I started learning more about neuroinflammation. And, uh, and I think it's a topic that it's really interesting. And I think that those of us who are in this field, not to the depth of a medical doctor, of course, but just be informed enough to, to make better decisions when it comes to, you know, guiding the client in, in, in their health. That's something that I uh, thoroughly look for when I assess my clients now. You know, I, I look at what their diet is and I look at how their diet uh, creates inflammation and how that creates cer certain brainwave patterns and how that is influencing that and how that gets in the way of optimal neurofeedback as well. Uh, I've had parents who come to see me and they go, well, you know, little Timmy is not paying attention, little Timmy this, little Timmy that. And when we go see, I, I have one particular case I remember when uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of slowing in, in this client's EG, it was, a, it was a child. And I send them to functional medicine, just a functional medicine doctor that I work with and I refer my clients to them. And the functional medicine doctor says, well, you know, this child can eat at least 20 slices of bread in one sitting. And I'm going, well, there's no wonder, you know, and unless you change that habit, you know, how can you possibly do optimal brain training? I mean, you could, you could train the brain to, to change that, but there has to be some degree of commitment and decline. It's important for the client to meet you halfway. You know, by, by learning about this, I, I learned about the concept of neuroinflammation and how it impacts your glia cells and your astrocytes. And it's really transformed the way I, I see and, uh, and do neurofeedback right now. And whenever I look at, uh, I sit down with Jay to look at an EEG and Jay is explaining the patterns, it makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, matter of fact, you know, we did, uh, I sat down with Jay to look at EEG a couple of days ago and Jay mentioned a little bit about, uh, you know, glia act, uh, activation, which has to do with neuroinflammation and it made perfect sense. And again, it comes back to this child having very poor nutritional choices. But I think that, uh, that neuroinflammation is a very important topic and it's something that shouldn't be overlooked because it's something that will show on the EG, it will show on your uh, client's behavioral patterns, it will show on your client's uh, uh, cognitive performance. I was gonna leave it up to the, um, the audience maybe, I was gonna throw out a recommendation, uh, Santiago, a guest that we had on before, Donna Jackson Nakazawa, I think I'm saying that correctly. Uh, the Angel and the Assassin, is takes a deep dive into <laughs> thanks jay it takes a deep dive into the the neural anatomy of how inflammation works it's fascinating and she, and she writes in a way that's very digestible it's it's story form she has human beings and their their afflictions right there to 
kind of carry, carry through and, and attach some of these maybe difficult to grasp concepts to humans. Um, so anyway, so there's a plug. If you don't want to go deep dive, we can send them to that book and then uh, they, they can read it for themselves. But I, I, I find that book uh, fascinating for one and just really, really informative. It I'm does like, have the ability to take extremely difficult information and digest it down. So it's palatable to those that don't necessarily have the background to, to dive in by themselves. So she's a very good guide through the through the deep weeds. Yeah, what, I, what I would say is when it comes to working with neuroinflammation or neurofeedback for that matter, I think the work should be uh, integrative and holistic. Um, you know, now I, when I do neurofeedback, I do consider these other elements. And as I said, I send the clients to functional medicine practitioners who can do proper neuroinflammation testing. You know, they have uh, stool testing and blood testing that can detect all this. Uh, you know, chemicals and uh, compounds in, 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 the, in the blood that are markers for, for neuroinflammation. And then I, I have the chance to learn how that's impacting my client's brain and how neurofeedback can be integrated into that. Uh, to, to that point, I have to say that, you know, when, when you're working with somebody um, and for the people who are listening to us, they need to, first thing is to seek professional help. Go to somebody with a proper qualifications and the proper credentials to look at you. And don't do a, uh, a Google search or anything like that. Now, as it pertains to, to QEG work, because as, as Jay was saying, I, I noticed it on some of the listservs and, and, the, uh, uh, and the Facebook groups where somebody who's not a, you know, a client posts a question and they post pictures of their, brain, of their maps and there's people diagnosing left and right. Uh, first thing I said, because if I learn anything from Jay is you have to look at raw EG. So the first thing I comment all the time is, do you have the raw EG? And I cannot count the number of times where the client, uh, there's clients who come to me here who have been to other uh, places to do their brain maps and they bring the, the maps. And I say, do you have the raw EEG? And they have no idea what the raw EEG is. So I show them a picture of what the raw EEG is and they go, well, no, they never showed me that. And I said, well, as, uh, as, a, uh, as a client, you have the right to those files. And they go ask for the files and more often than not, they're denied the files. The, the other places refuse to provide those files. And I say, well, there's nothing I can do without that. Uh, you know, I, I tell people, if you go to the emergency room because you're having, uh, you have abdominal pain, let's, let's think of this scenario. You have abdominal pain, you go to the emergency room and the doctor says, okay, I'm going to cut you open. You have to go into surgery right now. Would you let them cut you open? People go, of course not. And I'll say, well, if you're working with the brain, why would you let somebody work with your brain without looking at it? You know, your abdominal pain could be many things. It could be internal bleeding, it could be just parasites, it could be you're bloated, it could be anything. So what, what is the doctor going to do? Well, they have to do all these tests to, to make sure that, that, uh, that they don't need to cut you open or they need to uh, do, perform emergency surgery. And with the brain, I said the same thing. It, it all starts with the raw EEG. So if I have to say this for the listeners, if you're going for a brain map, my suggestion, my personal suggestion is you need to go to somebody who can learn, who can read and analyze that raw EEG for you, who can explain it to you in a way that is going to make perfect sense, who's gonna put it in layman's terms and is gonna help you understand what your problem is. Anybody can go to the maps and that's very easy, but you need somebody who can read the raw EEG and then refer to the proper professional with the proper credentials, should that be the case. So if you're listening to us, the first thing is, my personal recommendation is get a QEG that is raw EEG based, not just the maps. And then from there, we can take the necessary steps to talk about that. Now, now the raw EEG will give you markers for neuroinflammation. And you know, we can read those and say, there's a correlation between these brain waves and possible inflammation. And there's things that you can do to kind of guess, try to ascertain for yourself whether you have inflammation or not. Um, 
But then again, you know, you have to seek the proper medical advice. One of those things is, you know, I ask people, when you eat something, do you, do you recall times where you have eaten something, you get bloated? They go, yeah, I feel bloated. I get gassy. And I go, well, it's very likely there's permeability there, which means there's probably permeability in the brain. And that's how, as far as I go. And I go, I'm not going to go into more detail. I'm going to send you to this doctor. They're going to assess you for that. And more often than not, that's the case. Uh, but I think that, that looking into these components in addition to, to, to neurofeedback is quite helpful. And, and in a more holistic approach, I always like to look at exercise. You know, how much exercise is my, my client getting? Exercise is the, probably the best anti-inflammatory medicine there is. Uh, you know, proper nutrition, it does, it, it, nothing beats proper nutrition. And, you know, there, there's plenty of research on different types of diets and, and neuroinflammation, of course, that, uh, that you know, we can uh, provide uh, people with if they want to read it. Um, but, but then again, you have to look at those things, you know, how much exercise are you getting? Most of the people here are not getting any exercise. How much, what's your nutrition? Oh, well, it's uh, junk food based. I eat pizza and burgers and all these starchy foods. How much sleep are you getting? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's rare to see proper EG um, sleep right now. I think it's, it's, the, it's rather the exception of that in the rule. And, you know, Jay has commented on that and we've uh, shared this information with colleagues worldwide and people are not sleeping well. So if you don't have those three components working for you, if you're going to be inflamed for sure. If you're inflamed, you know, you're, the chances of your getting better, the chances for your, uh, for your brain optimization get lower. The, well, the post-COVID world is full of inflammatory changes that are identified as long hauler, uh, brain fog, and things such as that. The studies that have come out identify uh, inflammatory markers. Um, you, you can see those kinds of changes in the EEG. Uh, neuroinflammation ends up actually giving uh, EEG signatures. So, and everybody's a bit different. Uh, uh, some people will respond with um, autoimmune markers against their thyroid. Others will have autoimmune markers against myelin. Um, those are two dramatically different effects. Uh, autoimmune markers against your thyroid, your brain actually looks similar to a depressive brain. Uh, but autoimmune autoim markers against uh, myelin, uh, things are so dramatically slow, but cognitively the person is so messed up at that point, it's, it, it's really quite striking. Uh, we, we, did, um, inf uh, uh, we did EG and inflammatory marker uh, correlations after a toxic spill that happened in the Bay Area, oh goodness, now 24, 25, 26 years ago now. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, correlating autoimmune markers with EG features. So uh, it, it, it's an obscure area. It's not a common uh, thing to look for in EG. Most neurologists look at EG for epilepsy and gross encephalopathies. Um, the, the, you know, subtyping uh, autoimmune markers isn't something that they're uh, focused on. So uh, don't expect it to happen with a traditional EG. Um, in, in a hospital. Again, they're pretty limited in what they're used for. I think Jay brings an important point. And I, what some of the research that I have read is finding is that how well you cope with it um, after the infection and whether you become a long hauler or not will depend largely on your previous inflammation levels before you got infected. Um, it seems to be the case that for people who had low inflammation, who were eating well, exercising, taking care of themselves, for most of them, they recover a lot better. The long haulers tend to, to have uh, previous infections and obviously inflammation driven by poor lifestyle or other elements. So at the time of infection, they're faring not as well as, as the other group. And I think that anecdotally, I have found in my clients with other conditions when people come presented with depression or poor sleep. I think that who they were in terms of inflammation at the time the symptoms started uh, determines pretty well how fair they're gonna, you know, they're gonna progress throughout uh, the, the neurofeedback sessions. And, uh, and again, depending on what the, the type of intervention that you use is.
Thank you all for listening to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, Neuropsychology Podcast. We'd like to thank our Patreon business supporters, Jay. Oh my goodness, you're right. We're going to need a scrolling list. Outrageous Baking is a dedicated gluten-free bakery. It has been around for 15 years. Check them out at outrageousbaking.com. Tor Talk wants more people to discover text-to-speech at tortalk.se. Alternative Behavioral Therapy, Neurofeedback Service in Vancouver, Washington. Just ask for Joshua M. And Amazing Brains, welcome aboard, Micah, in Vail Valley in Summit County, Colorado. Just ask for Micah. We'd like to also thank you, EG and me, Saudi M, Jonathan Rowan, January Terrell, and we like Loretta T. Hey, do you have an idea for a topic or a guest? Please email me, Pete, at neuronoodle.com or leave us a voicemail with the link in the podcast notes. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And hey, if you really, really like us, you can buy us a coffee on Patreon slash Neuronoodle. We love our Patreon peeps, don't we, Jay? Absolutely. Cue the music. <laughs>